All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to um, this fantastic event, what we hope to be is a fantastic event. Um, the lecture on the science of COVID-19 and its vaccines presented by our very own Associate Dean, um, Matt Nugent. Um, some of you may know me, I'm Liz Cole, and I work in the Dean's office in the Kennedy College of Sciences, and we're so happy to have you. Um, this talk is being held as part of the Kennedy College of Sciences Spring into Science Week, um, and we hope you can join us for some of our other events happening this week. Um, and for details on those, I will put the link in the chat so you can pre-register if necessary. Um, we would not be able to have this lecture without the grateful donation of Eric Chasson and his wife, Loa. Um, Eric is the class of 1968, and um, they support this lecture, which is formally called the Kennedy College of Sciences Lecture Series on Science and Society. And we hope to host our next lecture in the fall in person, fingers crossed. Um, stay tuned for details. Um, and also, it's worth mentioning that this week we have our Days of Giving um, hosted by our alumni office. So please consider um, making your own gift of any size to UML during this fourth annual Days of Giving. The event is tomorrow and Thursday, April 14th and 15th. And we'll also put that link in the chat if anyone would like to make a gift um, ahead of time. They can make it today if they want. Um, as I put into the chat, some of you may have seen, we have both the chat feature and the Q&A um, live for this event. And we ask that you um, use the Q&A feature specifically for lecture related questions and the chat feature you can use to um, say hi to your friends, make any comments you want. Um, so yeah, um, and with that, I will hand the floor over to Tamita Bello, who is the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies um, from the Zuckerberg College of Health Sciences. And I would like to point out that he has been hand selected to give this intro of Matt. So <laughs> Tamita, it's all yours. Thank you, Liz. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, um, Matt Nugent. Um, Matt is currently Professor of Biology and the Associate Dean for Research, Innovation and Partnership in the Kennedy College of um, Sciences at UMass Lowell. Prior to joining us at UMass Lowell, uh, Matt was for decades uh, a professor of biochemistry, biomedical engineering, and ophthalmology at Boston University. And he likes to go by three different roles. Uh, uh, his research um, focuses um, mostly on understanding how cells in the body respond to signal after injury and uh, some of the statistics that uh, reflect uh, Matt's academic accomplishments include over 125 peer-reviewed publications, more than seven patents, over 250 invited lectures and published abstract, over $30 million of grant funded, competitive grant funding, mostly from the NIH over the course of uh, uh, three decades of his uh, research career, and an H index of 52, uh, which is uh, metric of um, how uh, the peers see his research. And, and it's, it's a very good index, which indicates that people read and cite his work. And uh, on a personal note, I have been working with Matt for three years now as colleagues, and uh, I, I have been blessed to work closely with him because he's a wonderful human being, a great mentor, and has become a great friend. And so it is my great pleasure to turn the floor to Matt now, I'll give the microphone to him. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Demeter. Thank you, Liz. I'm going to share my screen so we can get started today. All right. So as um, Liz said, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A. And then at the end of the uh, lecture, I'm going to do uh, my best, or we will do our best to try to answer um, your questions. So um, you might be shocked to realize that it was just a few years ago that we were gathering in big groups, smiling, no masks on, wearing funny glasses, in this case in August of 2017, to look at this beautiful corona that uh, was generated by the solar eclipse. And then now, simply two and a half years later, we have on the left an image, an electron micrograph of a newly discovered virus. And as you can see on that, electron micrograph, you see what appears to be a corona-like uh, structure around the outside of this virus. And lo and behold, 
this new virus was, was discovered as a novel coronavirus, and it was named SARS-CoV. SARS because it, it, uh, it causes a, a severe acute respiratory syndrome and COV because it's a coronavirus. So there are other coronaviruses. There are actually hundreds of coronaviruses. In humans, there are maybe five to six or seven that might cause common cold. And there are two others that cause severe disease. And this one is obviously causing an incredibly severe disease, an incredible pandemic that's affecting all our lives. So what I wanna to do today is um, help you, help us uh, understand the virus, understand how it works. And in, in understanding it, we hope to then be able to control it. So I figure no science lecture is complete without a pretentious reference to some Latin phrase that no one knows because we don't speak Latin. But in any case, here we go. A scientia potentia est, which means knowledge is power. So that's an interesting phrase. It's something we in the science world, we like to sort of think about and, and think about the fact that learning is what gives us the ability to improve the human existence and use the, improve the human uh, situation. When we're talking about a virus, we're talking about basically an invading organism or an invading uh, entity that is actually trying to kill us. Not trying to kill us. It has the possibility to kill us. It's not trying to do anything. The virus is dumb. The virus is just following laws of evolution. So when we think about this infection, we think about it truly as a battle. So we can, again, another quote from Sun Tzu, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. Bottom line of both of these quotes, I think are trying to get at the same point, which is by discovering how this virus works, um, we can identify the secret to beating it. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is what is the coronavirus? How does it infect us? How do these vaccines act to interfere with that infection? So the coronavirus on the left, again, you've seen this a million times on the news, this is an artist's rendition of the coronavirus. It's basically a little ball. It's 100 nanometers in diameter. So for all the Americans out there, it's 0 0.000004 inches in diameter. To put that in context, it's about one five thousandth the size of an average grain of sand. To put that, I think, in relative terms, the difference between the coronavirus and a grain of sand is the same, is similar to the difference between the average uh, height of a man and Mount Everest. So it is very tiny, but as I think we all can appreciate, its tiny size doesn't uh, translate to an insignificance. In fact, it's quite uh, diabolical and deadly. So let's look at the right, let's look at the anatomy. So again, you want to figure out how to stop something, you have to cut it open and figure out how it works. So on the right, we've essentially cut that ball in half and we're looking inside. And you see this little coil of yellow genetic material called RNA, we're gonna talk about that more as we come forward. And it is encased in a protective layer, this thing called a membrane. The membrane is made up of fat and cholesterol and that protects the RNA. And protruding out of it are some proteins. A particular one I want you to sort of pay attention to is this thing called spike protein. It's labeled pink here. It's not really pink in real life. Spike protein is gonna be one of the central characters in our story today. And like a sort of classic twist of literature, you're gonna also learn how we've taken advantage of the very sort of diabolical uh, activities of spike to turn it against this virus itself. So how does this virus then infect us? Well, here's just a, a brief cartoon to describe that. The virus, we generally, if we're gonna be infected with this virus, uh, we would generally inhale it. When we inhale it, it can then encounter us, uh, us, our, one of our cells. We call it the host cell, but we're the host, the human. And what this cartoon is, basically you're looking at a little section of a cartoon of a human cell. These double lines represent the membrane. Again, it's fat, and cholesterol, not water-soluble material that actually allows and creates a barrier between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, just like this membrane does on the virus itself. If the virus encounters a cell, it can bump into a protein that we express. This is a protein called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. This is a protein we make. We use it for very important reasons. And this uh, virus 
has found it, it has found the ability to sort of take advantage of the existence of this protein by sticking to it. So the spike protein sticks to ACE2, and that brings it in, in association with the cell surface, where then it can encounter another protein. This is a human protein we make called TMPRSS2. Um, I put it in the category of having the worst acronym in all of science, but in any case, this is what it's called. What is TMPRSS2? Um, it is a protein called a protease. That's a protein that has a catalytic activity. It means it can speed up a reaction. The reaction it can speed up is to clip another protein. So TMPRSS2 can cause a little clip, a little cleavage in the spike protein. And what that does when that happens is the spike protein then, as for all intents and purposes, turns inside out and becomes extended. So this sort of, again, cartoon is trying to reveal that. When that happens, portions of the spike protein that don't like to be around water, what we call hydrophobic regions or hydrophobic domains, become exposed to water. They don't want, water doesn't want the hydrophobic domains exposed, the hydrophobic domains don't want to be exposed. So basic physical properties take over and drive that protein into the membrane. Again, remember the membranes are fatty, um, we call lipid environment. So the protein is essentially poked right into our membranes and multiple proteins will poke into our membranes. That will pull the virus close, the virus membrane close to our membrane. And those membranes then essentially just fuse. And once they fuse, now this uh, viral uh, genetic material called RNA can just find, gain entry into our cell. This is infection, the, the injection of the viral RNA into our cells. What is RNA? We'll talk about it again later, but I think I'll give you a quick overview here. RNA is a, is a genetic material that encodes information about the structure of proteins. Proteins like TMPRSS2, ACE2, and Spike, those are our main players today. Proteins are the things that carry out activities in biology. So the um, our machinery, so the virus, again, the virus is dumb. For all intents and purposes, we don't consider virus alive, um, but it can use our machinery. So we have protein synthesis machinery. We have all kinds of just complex components that can then make proteins based on the code of this viral RNA. And we make multiple copies of those viral proteins. One of those viral proteins happens to be a protein that can make copies of RNA so it makes multiple copies of the viral RNA. Once we have multiple copies of viral RNA and enough viral proteins, they actually self-assemble inside our cell such that we get sometimes hundreds of these virus particles building up in our cell. Our cell becomes engorged with these viral particles so much so that the cell may become leaky or actually may even burst. And then these viruses then spill out into the environment and what can happen? They go to a neighboring cell, infect that, and that's how, how infection and, and ultimately how disease will propagate. But there's some good things. So um, our cells did not evolve just yesterday and this is not the first virus we've seen. So human cells and in, in, in across all species have evolved ways to deal with invading uh, organisms or in invading, in this case, invading genetic material. Um, so this would be, a, again, a cartoon of a human cell where a bunch of viruses have infected the cell or have been replicated in this cell. And our cell then has a, a sort of a response. There's an ability to detect that there's foreign genetic material in the cell. And when our cell detects this gen there's foreign material, it will send out an alarm, a hormone called interferon. This is sort of the immediate alarm signal. So this interferon will go out to neighboring cells, cells nearby, and essentially it's telling those neighboring cells to, hey, turn down the machine, shut down the factory, um, turn off or turn to very low levels, your protein synthesis material, your uh, protein synthesis activities. Essentially, it's kind of like saying, hey, there's a bad guy in the neighborhood, lock the doors, turn off the lights. So that's step one. Step two, as the cell becomes infected and as these uh, viruses start to build up and the cell starts to feel very sick. And there's a lot of, again, a lot of signals that will tell the cell that it's in trouble. The cell then produces something called cytokines. These are small proteins. They'll be released, they're diffusible. They will diffuse away from the cell that's infected and actually out into the circulation. And when they do that, 
they will activate what's called our innate immune system. This is different than what we're talking about with the vaccines, different than antibodies. This is the white blood cells. These are the first responders of infection. And they are incredibly aggressive, incredibly uh, powerful, but not very smart to say, they're not very specific. So these cells will just come borrowing into the tissue, looking for a virus to gobble up, and they'll even attack infected cells and kill our own affected cells. So again, they're, they're very aggressive, and to some degree, they do damage to our tissue in order to get access to the infection. So I like to think of it in, in some ways like the way a firefighter might take their ax and, and tear a hole in your wall in your house. There's actually doing damage to that house, but they're doing that damage in order to try to prevent the fire from destroying the entire house. And that's similar here. Problem with SARS-CoV, the coronavirus that we've been dealing with, is it is sort of in a constant evolutionary battle has evolved an ability to repress step one, to repress this interferon signal so that the cell that becomes infected doesn't tell the neighbors. So what happens? Then these viruses go into the neighboring cells and their biosynthetic machinery is up at full blast and those cells grow a lot of virus and, more, and so on and so on. And because of that, a consequence of that is it actually increases step two because all those cells become very engorged with virus particles and they're sending out lots and lots of cytokines. So we have actually an overaggressive uh, innate immune response. And in fact, that is what is the disease. COVID-19, the disease caused by the virus is actually an inflammatory disease. What happens is the virus infects there's sort of a, a pre-symptomatic phase when there's no symptoms, so the first, say, five days. Big problem with this virus is, unlike a lot of other viruses, they, the virus can build up enough so that it actually can be infectious during that time, and we've all discovered that. So when someone says, I'm fine, I don't have any symptoms, that doesn't tell you that they're not able to infect you. And then as the uh, disease progresses, again, the sign of the inflammation, pain, fever, weakness, this is all the inflammatory response. Again, your inflammatory response evolved to, to deal with this very tight battle, right? And so this is like an invading army is in this town square and your defending army is there as well and the bullets are flying and, and there will be some collateral damage. And in fact, sometimes it gets so out of control that there's this term we use called cytokine storm, where there's so much release of cytokine that we get generate severe disease. When we generate severe disease, these inflammatory cells, as they come in from blood or something called the lymphatic system, they actually cause those systems to become leaky. And in fact, in, in the case of lung, which is a, again, an example with this coronavirus, very important example, you'll actually get fluid that builds up in the tiny air sacs that are supposed to be exchanging oxygen and, and exchanging gases, such that our lung becomes less capable, in some cases incapable, of sufficiently providing oxygen to our um, tissues and organs. And that's when you have the pneumonia that can ultimately lead to quite serious, serious consequences, including death, that we've seen too much of. So um, I've told you that Spike is gonna be one of our players. ACE2 is its sort of unwitting collaborator. ACE2 is a protein we make, we need it, it's important, um, but Spike has co-opted it as a means to get in. So it all starts when Spike sticks to ACE2. Um, this is the necessary and critical step. If the virus can't get in our cells, it can't make us sick, it can't replicate. Again, the virus is dumb, it's just, just following these rules of chemistry. So we say that spike and ACE2 have affinity for one another. And that's a description in chemical terms where we talk about why two compounds might stick to one another and not others. Um, it is actually a really complicated topic. So uh, uh, Dr. Bello gave a very nice introduction and talked about some work I've done. I'd say I've probably spent a good part of the past 35 years trying to understand affinity. So probably embarrassing to say, because I haven't figured it out yet. But I thought we could just give an example so you can appreciate what we're talking about when we're talking about these two molecules coming together. So in this example, um, we have our scientist person and our mustache guy. They might be at a party, they might be out at a nightclub, and the scientist might be looking over and say, oh, that guy looks pretty interesting. Um, 
guy's maybe not as deep a thinker as, as the scientist might believe, but in any case, our scientist takes the chance and yells out, hi, do you like science? Hi, yes, I do like science. I also like long walks on the beach. Wow, I also like long walks on the beach. So now a connection is being made and there is some natural affinity. And these two might then formally come up, start talking, hang out, and we would say there is affinity for one another. They've made a connection. So there's some, some components that have pulled these two, in this case, people together. But let's think about a different situation. Again, we have our scientist and our mustache guy. Um, the scientist again thinks, oh, that guy looks kind of interesting, but we're not alone. Here's an old friend from college shows up. Yo, dude, I haven't seen you since our band broke up in college. Let's hang out all night. Science lady, oh, well, forget about it. Poor mustache guy is a little sad. Because what has happened is this friend from college also had an affinity for the mustache guy. In a sense, functioned like an antibody. And we're going to talk about antibodies in a minute. And this is competing affinities. So the antibody has blocked the connection. So we can think of the scientist as ACE2, uh, mustache guy as Spike, and college buddy as the antibody. So antibodies, this is what we're all interested in now. We're all interested in how a vaccine might be able to prevent disease. And we're, again, uh, going to be talking about how these vaccines are targeting that very interaction between Spike and ACE2 and trying to do exactly as this uh, image had displayed. So here's now a cartoon. We're actually talking about what an antibody is. So an antibody like ACE, like Spike, like TMPRSS2 is a protein. We're going to talk a little about proteins later if you don't remember them from high school biology, college biology, or, or whatever stage you've learned. Um, but an antibody is a protein that has affinity for something else. And the something else it happens to have affinity for is called an antigen. In this case, I'm showing an example when an antibody by binding to spike protein, like our college buddy, is now blocking the ability of that spike protein to bind to ACE2 and therefore would block infection. Interesting and, and importantly, um, our immune system is also set up to recognize when something has antibodies stuck to it, it means that's something that we don't want around. So are these aggressive immune cells, these white blood cells, they'll also chew this up when they see an antibody stuck to it. So where do antibodies come from? Um, I've often said, you know, maybe if I had a thousand hours, I might be able to explain to the best that I can understand what's called the adaptive immune system. It's probably the most fascinating um, biological system that I'm aware of, and it's really incredibly complicated. But I'm gonna to try to do this in one slide. Adaptive immunity, unlike innate, innate immunity is there. You get infected, those guys are triggered to act. Adaptive immunity is immunity that adapts to what you've been infected by or what foreign agent is present. So the way this works is in your bone marrow, all of our bone marrows are something called progenitor B cells. These are cells that um, have the ability to replicate and to replicate and to produce something called mature B cells or naive B cells. And when they do that, each time they do that, they rearrange the genetic material that encodes antibodies. So they rearrange it randomly. And in so doing, they generate individual cells, multiple ones, but individual cells that will have a unique antibody, right? So they may make in a given day, 10 to the eighth, 10 to the ninth, different cells, each with a different antibody. And again, this is done not because of nature is saying we need antibodies to spike or antibodies to something else. They just make a whole array of antibodies. In fact, some estimates are that uh, this progenitor cell can rearrange itself in a up to 10 to the 18th, or so what's referred to as a quintillion, so that there's distinct different antibodies. So we have, again, this is a really fascinating thing. We have in our, in our genes, basically the ability to make antibodies for things that don't exist yet, things that we have never encountered. Now, these cells that we make, we make them all the time. They go out into our bloodstream and they're naive, so they don't know what's, what they're encountering. They're in our bloodstream. Maybe they'll spend anywhere from uh, you know, several days to maybe as much as two weeks, and then they just die. They just die unless they encounter an antigen. So each one of these is a different antibody that would have different affinity. So again, our scientist lady, like people that have uh, 
that uh, enjoy long walks on the beach. This one may enjoy a different thing and this enjoys a different thing and different thing and so forth. So if an, an antigen happens to bind to one of these naive B cells, it becomes activated. And what happens when it becomes activated? It interacts with another cell type called the T helper cell. We don't have to talk about the details of that, but then it becomes triggered to say that, okay, I am activated. There is something that actually finally sticks to my antibody. And that trigger results in this activated B cell to undergo one of two choices. One, it starts to replicate many, many times and it transforms itself from a cell that produces and expresses antibodies on its surface to a cell that, that secretes antibodies and secretes quite, quite many antibodies. So these are called plasma cells. These are the cells now in your blood that are releasing millions of copies of antibodies into the blood. Why is it making that antibody? Because this system has said, Yep, that's one we need. So now we start making it. But this whole process takes a couple of weeks to happen. The other fascinating thing here is the activated B cell, instead of becoming a plasma cell, a certain fraction will replicate and become memory B cells. So they're sort of essentially pre-activated cells. They will sit in a lymph node and they can sit there sometimes for years, even decades. And they're ready. So the next time you encounter this antigen, for instance, this virus, you don't have to wait two weeks for you to select for a naive B cell. Instead, you already have these ready to go so that you get infected or you get exposed to this virus particle and you're ready to just start making antibodies so you don't ever get sick. So this is a great thing. Um, it's sort of what we call natural immunity. This is how it forms. Um, and what we are interested in doing is somehow can we take advantage of this same system? Can we induce an antibody response in memory cells without actually getting sick? And I think you know the answer. That's sort of the concept behind what vaccination is. Vaccines, how do they work? Basically, they are harnessing the power of the adaptive immune system. So these are um, probably one of, of mankind's greatest medical achievements and the number of lives saved is probably uncountable when you look at all the different uh, vaccines in, in practice today. So how do they work? How do traditional vaccines work? Well, traditionally, scientists might spend years trying to carefully select and grow up a slightly weakened form of a virus or some other kind of germ. And you might grow it in cell cultures and try to switch the species, maybe grow it in, um, in fertilized eggs. And this is the painstaking process. But then eventually you might get in a virus that's similar enough to the dangerous virus, but not so similar that it makes you sick. And you inject people with that uh, crippled virus in hopes that you generate antibodies and generate memory cells. So that then if you encounter the actual pathogen, the actual disease causing virus, you're ready to attack it. And this works well, it takes a long time. But as I think a lot of us know, we've had miraculous achievement in the past year, which is that we've been able, to, we, the field, the world, the human, uh, race has been able to develop COVID vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines. So how do they work and what are the difference? Well, the three um, that have gotten emergency use authorization in the United States, and again, we'll talk about Johnson & Johnson a little bit later in, in the pause that's currently on there, but all three have at a very fundamental level, the same goal. They all uh, have a goal of inducing our cells to produce that spike protein, that viral protein, the spike protein, so that our immune system will recognize it as not self and will activate a B cell response. Now, Pfizer and Moderna are doing that by using viral RNA. Johnson & Johnson is in AstraZeneca, which isn't in our country, is, is uh, using a crippled virus to produce viral proteins. There are several other approaches being tested and in development or in even in practice in other parts of the world, but I'm not gonna talk about those today. But in order to talk about these, um, I'm gonna take a step back and do a little biology 101 for those who are less familiar with these terms I've been using. So um, most of you probably have heard of DNA. DNA is the genetic material. This is the, the blueprint, the fundamental blueprint of life. All of our cells have it. Um, it contains, in, again, what you've heard of, the genes, which genes to some degree we're thinking of each gene, where it being reflective of a given, a specific protein. So the DNA in a human cell is, this is the blueprint. This is the master plan. It's stored safely away in, in a 
part of the cell called the nucleus. And when our cell or when our system needs a certain protein to be made, um, there's a system in place to make a copy of a region of the DNA, a copy of maybe one of those genes. And we make that copy in a form of messenger RNA. Messenger RNA, unlike DNA, is single-stranded. The messenger RNA then is exported from the nucleus of the cell out to the cytoplasm, so the same place where that virus is infecting, where our protein synthesis machinery can then make multiple copies of a given protein because we might need it. So we have a protein we need, our system says make an RNA copy of that DNA blueprint and then make uh, the proteins as we, as we need. So that's exactly what Pfizer and Moderna are trying to do. They say, okay, let's take just the spike protein RNA, not the entire RNA that's present in the virus, because that could make us sick, just the spike protein RNA, inject that into people in the hopes that it will get in their cells and those cells will then make the spike protein. That spike protein will then activate a B cell and therefore activate the generation of antibodies to spike protein and uh, the generation of memory cells, the B cell memory cells. <clears throat> now, some of you are really smart. I know all of you are probably very smart, but some of you probably already looked at this thing and you said, wait a minute, I see something interesting there. You said mRNA has a very, very short half-life. And in fact, it does. mRNA is incredibly unstable. And it's not just unstable because nature didn't get it good enough. It's not just unstable because we can't make it stable. It's unstable because there are active processes in place in biology that, are, that were designed to chew up RNA. And there are these enzymes called RNases. RNases. Um, they're there to, turn, to chew up RNA almost soon after it's made. It sounds kind of silly. Even more so, they're very aggressive RNases. If we find RNA or any genetic material outside of a cell, that's usually a bad sign. So now we're sort of, again, thinking of Moderna and, and, and uh, Pfizer and like, how are they going to deal with this? But even more, why is this? Why would we want to be making RNA and then just chewing it up? Well, um, to live in a very complex environment, biological organisms have to be able to adjust to rapidly changing demands. We sometimes think about you might be asleep, you might be climbing a rock, you might be running from a lion. Um, we have to be adjustable and, and very rapidly able to adjust. So the cost of that is we make RNA when we need it, we make the protein, we just chew it up so that at any time, if we need that protein, we'll just make the RNA. If we need a different protein, we'll make a different RNA. But that's a problem now. Pfizer and Moderna, RNA is very unstable, particularly uh, unstable if it's outside of a cell. And how are they gonna get that RNA into your cell? Well, luckily there's this, whole world full of what we call basic scientists, scientists that study all kinds of things. And there are scientists, particularly a group of scientists at University of Pennsylvania that for the past 20 years have been studying RNA and RNA stability. And what they discovered is that there is a modified form of RNA that can be made stable. In particular, again, those who remember their biology might remember that RNA is made up of an arrangement in a certain sequence of four nucleotides, A, G, C, and U. Um, there is, and again, it was discovered, a very, very uh, a minor version of uridine. So uridine can be in a slightly different form called pseudouridine. This was discovered. It's a naturally occurring uh, nucleotide. And it was discovered that if you substitute all the uridines with this nucleotide, it changes the shape of the RNA just enough that that RNA can't grab onto it so well and can't chew it up so well. So instead of uh, making RNA with U, which would be the standard way you'd learn in a textbook, um, we can in a test tube, and that's what Moderna and Pfizer are doing. Pfizer is actually doing this right in Andover, not far from where I'm sitting. Um, in a test tube, they, they throw in the building blocks, A, C, G, and instead of U, they throw in pseudouridine in the RNA now that's produced um, might last for hours and maybe even a day instead of minutes. So that's one thing. Okay, we can stabilize it once we get it in the cell. How do we get it in the cell? And how do we make sure it doesn't get chewed up when it's outside the cell? And that is how do you deliver this modified RNA to cells? And this, um, again, scientists have been working on this, again, for somewhere in the order of 25 years, maybe even longer than that. Um, in particular, they took advantage of looking at how nature dealt with this. 
So the coronavirus also has to protect its RNA and it does it by encasing it in a phospholipid, basically a fat um, membrane. So what uh, Pfizer and Moderna are doing is they are encapsulating this RNA in a protective fat uh, lipid shell. So um, there, the RNA is incorporated into what's called a nanoliposome. It's about the size of the coronavirus, but it's basically fat um, and cholesterol, natural ingredients, in fact. And then it's actually linked with something called PEG, and this sort of helps it stay floating in, in uh, extracellular fluid, um, and it eludes our innate immune system. So that now, when these liposomes that I had injected in my shoulder last Thursday, when they encounter the surface of our cells, in particular types of cells called astrocytes, macrophages, other cells like that, um, the membrane will essentially fuse again, similar to the way the virus does, will fuse with our membrane. Instead of shooting viral RNA in, they shoot just the RNA for this spike protein. Um, and that RNA they're using is that pseudouridine instead of uridine. So it should sit around our cells for several hours and allow our cells to make protein spike protein for quite some time. So that's the Moderna and Pfizer. What about the Johnson & Johnson approach? Um, it's a bit different. So the Johnson & Johnson approach, instead of injecting RNA directly, they're um, converting the RNA from the spike protein to DNA, and they're incorporating that in what's called a replication deficient virus. This is a virus, it's called an adenovirus. They classically give us common cold, but this adenovirus has had some of its genetic material removed, so it's incapable of replicating once it gets in the cell. Again, inject this in your arm, it's taken up by some of our cells. The DNA is then you know, it converted to RNA in our cell, to messenger RNA, which is then converted to protein and expressed. And so then again, we express the spike protein, and the spike protein activates these B cells to produce antibodies and to produce memory. But there's another problem. Now you guys, again, there's some smart people out there are probably thinking, okay, I remember he talked about the spike protein, it binds to ACE2, and then it gets near this other, this enzyme called, again, terrible name, TMPRSS2, and that thing clips it. <clears throat> and indeed it does. And it causes this spike protein to, again, like I said, almost turn inside out and elongate. The problem is this would happen spontaneously in our vaccinated cells. And then we would raise antibodies to this, what we call fusion spike. And the problem is antibodies to fusion spike do, would not bind to prefusion spike and they would not block prefusion spike from binding to ACE2. And again, another problem. And the additional piece of this problem is in fact, spike protein is sort of compressed in this sort of very particular structure. I know this is a different way of looking at it. Um, <clears throat> But in, in that manner, it can actually spontaneously, oops, it spontaneously unfold into this per, uh, fusion spike again. So this is a, a problem because if we make only this, we'll make antibodies to it and we won't actually prevent infection. But once again, um, there was a really good uh, group of scientists who about 10 years ago, studying the spike protein from a different coronavirus, one of the coronaviruses that causes a different illness, but not anywhere near as significant as the COVID-2, um, discovered that you could make a small change in the sequence of spikes, so small change in the genetic sequence. And it's a, basically you're inserting what's called two prolines, not important here for you to think about that. It's again, a small change that then stabilizes it. So again, what was a really interesting two things or important is it turns out the spike protein is quite similar across all these coronaviruses. So by studying this virus, 10 years ago, over the past 10 years, he, he and or they were prepared um, to sort of provide this information. And so all three of the uh, approved, uh, the vaccines are currently in use in the US are using a slightly modified spike protein. So it's stabilized, they stabilize the RNA, they encapsulate the RNA, and that's how it works. So we have some good news. And I think you all have certainly heard about this and, and have seen it. Um, and this is just the, the uh, initial clinical trials from the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. And what was done here, um, if you're familiar with the way a trial worked, is they took about 40,000 volunteers and sort of matched them up sort of randomly. So not all 
the older or all the younger were in one group or the other. Um, and they gave um, half of them a, a what's called placebo, which was really just essentially salt water injection. They gave the other half um, the COVID vaccine. And then they monitored them over time and what they saw and they were looking for the appearance of COVID-19, basically the appearance of disease or of infection. And in the blue, you'll see that over time in the uh, placebo case, we see just a steady increase in the incidence of disease of COVID-19. In the red, this is the uh, vaccinated group. You'll notice that initially it didn't look very different than the placebo group. That's soon after the first shot of the, vac of the vaccine. But essentially, as we got later and later, and particularly after the second dose, very, very few uh, of the participants got COVID-19. And in fact, at the end, what was published is 162 in the uh, placebo group got one got COVID and eight in the uh, vaccinated group. Again, they were no one was given COVID, no one was induced to have COVID. These people just went about their normal life. So this is where we get the 95% is the base of the ratio between those two. Moderna vaccine uh, uh, trial, very similar and very similar results. J&J &J was a slightly different trial design and also different time and place, but again, was very successful. And more importantly, all three of these vaccines are shown to be incredibly effective at preventing severe disease and certainly uh, preventing death. Now, you've probably heard that the J&J &J this morning that the FDA put a pause on. And we're going to talk a little about that as we go forward. Um, FDA is incredibly safety conscious, and they sort of are following the do no harm um, motto, and we'll talk a little about that. But the bottom line is all three vaccines do work and do work well. But I think it's, it's certainly quite reasonable and, I, and, and understandable that we're hearing they're using new technology. They made these vaccines so much faster than before. Um, are they safe? And what I can tell you so far from reviewing the data is the data are really good and really strong about regarding safety. What about extreme problems like death? So um, there's the federal government runs something called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, where all um, adverse events are reported and collated and accumulated and calculated. Um, in the last report, which was published the end of March, has at this point, at that point, we had 145 million doses of COVID vaccines were administered. And at that point, there were 2,500 reported deaths among people who received the vaccine. Then a detailed analysis of their medical records found no evidence that the vaccine contributed to those deaths. That is, it's very likely, we don't know for sure, but it's very likely that those deaths were coincident with the vaccine. And just to sort of put that in context, think about this. In 2018, in the United States, before COVID, on average, about 8,000 people died per day, because people unfortunately die. We all know that, it's sort of one of the challenges of being alive. Um, so in this time that we did these vaccines, we'd estimate somewhere in the order of 800,000 Americans would die. So that's one possibility, right? But even if the extremely unlikely possibility that every one of these deaths was caused by the vaccine, that still would be a 0.0017% uh, death rate, which again is an incredibly low value and low level risk, particularly if we put that in comparison um, to in stark comparison to the disease itself. About 30 million Americans have gotten have come down with COVID-19, and we've had over 550,000 deaths. That's a one and a half percent death rate in at the very least. But more importantly, somewhere in the order of 10% of the people that get this disease have serious effects that can lead to damage to things like heart and lung tissue. So everything certainly comes with risk, risk of a vaccine from the data. And there are a lot of data. It's very rarely do we collect so much data so fast. Um, the risk of the vaccine is certainly far below the risk of COVID. Now the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which today um, the FDA said, let's put a pause on. That doesn't mean the FDA thinks there's something wrong with it. It means that there were six cases of a very rare blood clotting uh, event out of 6.8 million doses that have been administered. So that's less than one in a million. Um, again, just to sort of put risk benefit in, in comparison, uh, in 2019, there were over 4 million people seriously injured in automobile accidents. So that's greater than one in 100. So in fact, if you calculate it, it's actually a greater risk to drive to a quickie mart to get a snack than it is actually to get the Johnson & Johnson. In fact, a significantly greater risk. So we make 
sort of this decision regularly on a day basis to go buy some Fritos. Um, yet we're sort of uh, looking at, at this uh, potential low level risk as something serious. But again, it goes back to what FDA's sort of mission. Safety is their first uh, and important characteristic of their, their mission. And I think it's actually quite comforting to recognize that the government is constantly surveilling this information and that we would put a pause on something like this to make sure that there isn't uh, some confounding factor. What they're ultimately gonna be looking for, is there something special about these six people? Do they have a special uh, comorbidity that would then suggest they shouldn't get this vaccine? Are these blood clotting events even related to the vaccine or again, is it coincident? And so that's something that I think we will um, be looking at and constantly look at. And that's what the, uh, again, that V-A-R-E-S, V-A-E-R-S system is all about. So we want the vaccines to stop infection, stop the spread. And so I thought we'd just go through a quick thought experiment to think about how that actually can work. So if a person is infected and there's no mitigations, that person will go about their life. They might interact with family, friends, person at a coffee shop, in line at the supermarket. So they might very likely expose about a um, hundred other healthy people to the virus that they're infected with. So you'd have a hundred sick people, might expose 10,000 people. And what has been determined based on at least the initial, the non-variant form, that would lead to about 2.5 new infections for every person. So that would grow to 250 after another two weeks, another two weeks, another two weeks. Um, and if you see that, it's showing that we went from 100 over eight weeks to over 3,000 infected people. So we saw that, we've seen it too many times, the spike, the infections grow. But what about the vaccine? So let's say we have a vaccine that's 95% effective, and we do. Um, if 75% if of the population were inoculated, some of those inoculated people might be susceptible to breakthrough infection. Um, and the rest of the healthy people might be, are susceptible to infection. So we'd have 100 sick people, they might expose 10,000 people, but only 2,900 would be susceptible. So that we'd see a reduction from 100 sick people, there'd be 72 new infections and on and on and on. And after eight weeks, we've cut that by 75%. So again, this very simple model can be extended where we can look at how, what percent of vaccination do we need to achieve before we start to see a reduction in cases. So the blue line again is our no vaccine case. We've seen that. We have 100 infected people in a matter of 20 weeks, we have 100,000 infected people. If we had vaccinated 20% of the population, we can bring that down a little bit, but not much. And in fact, even at 50 and 60%, case number is still increasing. And then we start to see a tipping point. And again, this is a simple model, but the tipping point is generally somewhere between 60 and 70%, 80%. We start to see this uh, case number rapidly dropping. So we start to recognize the value of a very high percent vaccinated group to eventually wipe out this virus. And in fact, if the day the, the vaccine came out, we were able to vaccinate 100% of the people, this virus would have been gone in about a little over a month. But um, I've mentioned a couple of times this term variants and you've heard about it, it's very frightening. And so what is the deal with all these variants? Well, um, I've told you a lot about spike protein and in fact, the variants have a lot to do with the spike protein itself again. So the spike protein is subject to mutation. What that means is every time a virus gets in your cell and replicates, every time that RNA is copied, there's a chance that an error could be made. And when we get sick with COVID-19 and the estimates are it might take anywhere from several hundred to a thousand viruses that we've inhaled to make us sick, we will then convert that thousand uh, viruses to anywhere from one to 100 billion viruses. So there's many, many opportunities. So every time a person gets sick, there will be mutations made. And those mutations have the possibility to improve the function of spike protein. But let's talk about that. So I told you at the beginning, spike protein binds to ACE2. It has affinity for ACE2, and that helps the virus then get into the cell. So what else does spike have to do? Isn't it already do what it needs to do? Um, well. To understand this, um, we have to take kind of a trip into the molecular scale world. So we live in a world where big things move around when they choose. At the small scale, the molecular scale, there's something called thermal motion or a random force that causes everything to constantly jiggle around. These are nanoparticles in water and no one is shaking this. 
This is just the motion that's induced by the temperature of the system. So in fact, thermal motion to some degree is just another way to describe what we call temperature. So everything is moving around. Pro the virus is moving around, proteins are moving around. How does that impact our viral system and how does that infect, impact uh, infectivity? So COV-2 is jiggling around all day long because it's outside of our cell. It might bump into the surface of our cell and then bounce off, no problem to us. Um, these proteins on the surface of the cell, ACE2 and TMPRS2, SS2, are moving around. They're also just randomly moving around. This force is random. Um, it is just based on the temperature of the system. Everything is jiggling. And sometimes the SARS-CoV might actually attach to the ACE2 because it bumped into it, again, through this random motion process. But it has to hold tight long enough for TMPRSS2, whatever that thing is called, to get close enough to clip that spike protein. But it's, it, and it, therefore it must resist that random force. And sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, every time the virus is outside of the cell, it can't replicate. And every moment it's outside the cell, it's more susceptible to being gobbled up by one of our innate immune cells. So how do mutations alter this dynamic? Well, to do this, we're gonna again, do one more biology 101. So um, we talk about RNA. RNA has code. These codes, again, those uh, nucleotides in particular order code for particular amino acids. All proteins, viral proteins, human proteins, slime mold proteins, they're all made up of 20 amino acid, potential amino acids. Amino acids are a chemical group and each amino acid type is slightly different chemically. So I've marked two of them here, one called aspartate, one called arginine. Aspartate has a negative charge, arginine has a positive charge. Um, so you, you would have Read the protein synthesis machine would be reading the RNA and it would say, come to this GAU and go, okay, let's put an aspartate, grab an aspartate, put it there. GGU, let's grab a glycine, grab a glycine, put it there, and so on. And you can also then imagine when the RNA replication, so the system that's, re, that's uh, replicating that RNA or copying that RNA, if, in, if it made a mistake here, which it can, instead of putting a G or put an A there, you get an aspartate instead of a glycine. So proteins are made of a whole chain of amino acids. And that's the defining element of a protein is which amino acids in which order and how many. So a protein might be made here and you see this ribosome man making a protein. And these are the spike and ACE2 proteins are made. And in this case, we're gonna look at the potential for why and how they would come together come together when they make specific chemical interactions. So a simple way to think of it is we can think of opposite charges attracting. So here we have an aspartate and arginine, two places that are pulling these two proteins and holding them, resisting that thermal motion, right? So what can a mutation do? Well, if a mutant occurs, a mutation happens, maybe in this position, no, not that one, a different one. Yeah, that position, we get an aspartate that mutates into there. And so now this spike protein might have the ability to make an additional contact. Now, in fact, the contacts aren't all charge charge, but this is an easy way to describe it. So now that might make it tighter. So it's gonna resist that thermal motion just slightly more. Now, luckily mutations occur randomly. And again, the virus is not choosing to do this. This happens. So most mutations are actually not beneficial. So in this case, we don't bind as well. We bind worse and that's fine. So, how, do, how does spike and ACE tie, hold tighter? It's basically, full, it's a matter of fighting and, and holding against that random force of thermal motion. So there are um, a couple of major variants that we've been studying, the UK variant, the South African variant. They have some differences, but there is one mutation in common for both of them. And it's a mutation in the spike, the region of spike that binds ACE2. And it's indicated here, it's, it's a certain amino acid called an asparagine that's converted to a, a tyrosine at position 501 in that long chain of jelly beans. And what uh, scientists are able to do is isolate that mutated spike protein, compare it to the wild type one by attaching it to this little needle, letting it bind to the ACE2 on the cells, and then physically measuring the force it takes to pull them apart. And what you can see here is that this mutant N501 to Y, it takes more force to pull it apart. And in fact, we can look at that at a very fine level. 
And what we see is here is the wild type uh, spike protein, purple here, um, makes an interaction between these two groups, chemical groups. And you see here in the mutant form, that interaction at least indicated here, you can see it's a little closer. In fact, it's a little bit stronger. And so I'm not gonna sort of bore you with any more um, details of uh, physical chemistry, which I love, but um, I think what I want you to have as a take home message is these variants are occur occurring all the time. A variant can make spike protein better and we can understand it at a scientific level down to a really fine tuned uh, chemical level. So I have some good news for you. The vaccines are safe and effective. The current vaccines work against the major variants so far. So in, in maybe with slightly less effectiveness in some, but, but they work against the major variants. The mutation rate of SARS-CoV actually, thankfully, is relatively low compared to some other viruses, so four times lower than the flu. Um, reducing transmission will reduce evolution. So if we reduce transmission by vaccinating, we will prevent the generation of more variants. Vaccine delivery and acceptance are expanding, particularly the past couple of months. We've seen incredible expansion in this country. But there is bad news. Each infection does lead to new mutations. It's not if, it's yes, they lead to new mutations. Sometimes those mutations lead to improved uh, function for the virus, which is bad for us. Infection rate uh, remains relative, uh, too high. And it's again, not if, but when more deadly viruses will emerge. But I also have some very good news for you. The very good news is that RNA vaccines, particularly that Moderna and Pfizer technology, can be easily modified. In fact, you could design a new RNA in a matter of hours, have it in production and manufacturing within a matter of weeks. Um, and the science is ongoing. In addition to vaccines, there are new therapeutics in development that aim to treat people that are already infected. Vaccines prevent infection. They don't help once you're infected. So question a lot of us have, and I think a lot of the public certainly have is, wow, how did this happen so fast? And my answer is it didn't. In fact, we've been living through a rapidly accelerating revolution of molecular biology, our ability to, the ability of scientists to understand the molecular basis of, of life. And that is, like I said, it's been accelerating and has led to this point where now we can use that information. And we have a lot of uh, people to thank and a lot of organisms to thank. This is a picture of a lot, what we refer to as the model organisms used traditionally in biology. Each provides insight into a particular biological phenomena. So, um, when you hear about a federally funded project to study fruit fly mating habits, recognize and realize that that's all part of this whole thing. And that it's a basically investments in basic science really are what have led to the development of these therapies. This is quite uh, remarkably the culmination of years of, of scientists saying this will eventually be allow, help us to fight these types of diseases. So, um, and if I was teaching a class, I always come back to the beginning and then I look and I ask someone in the back of the room to, to see if they were paying attention. And I'd ask again, what does this phrase mean? And you all would say knowledge is power. And I think certainly that's true, but I hope um, what I've tried to cover today is to demonstrate how knowledge quite literally, quite literally is saving lives every day. So um, we're not done yet. We are working, working toward uh, a normality again. And I like to sort of uh, reiterate the fact that we vaccinate not only to protect ourselves, but we vaccinate to protect each other. So when I have friends and relatives that tell me they got vaccinated, I usually say thank you. And I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors, Eric and Lola Chazon, Lola, uh, Chazon um, the Kennedy College of Science, and particularly Liz Cole, who really organized everything and sent out all the notices to make sure everyone could get on here. Um, UMass Lowell, scientific research funding, and every scientist that uh, toiled away in relative obscurity, and trust me, it's pretty obscure, um, to, because they were interested in how things work, because they asked why. And that's where we get new knowledge, and that's where new knowledge allows us to do things like create a vaccine in a matter of six months that can save millions of lives. So thank you all, and I'm happy to try to answer questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing. It's also quite interesting to talk when you can't see anyone. <laughs> um, I wanted to know if Nora Dean wanted to say hi first or if we wanted to do the question and answer first. Why don't you go with the question and answers first? I think my, my right. hi is not. Okay, all right, thank you. 
Um, so we've had an excellent Q and A um, discussion that's come through already, and I, I, so I'm going to go between the Q and A from um, what's happening live right now and some of the questions that have come through from when people have registered. Um, so the first question, Matt, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Why do people who have been infected need to be vaccinated? It's a great question. So um, I'll start with um, my expertise, biochemistry, molecular biology, cell biology. Um, I will give you the, my best answer of that, but really that comes from uh, a, a huge number of people with much more expertise in infectious disease than I have. But the answer, the general answer is um, the vaccines are safe and there is a probability and a possibility that you, after being infected, your natural immunity, which may be very generalized, so you may have generated immunity to certain components of this system, um, that having targeted immunity specific to the spike protein could add to your success at preventing reinfection. So that's the reason. Um, and there, it's again, FDA does this, uh, uh, disease biologists do this, and epidemiologists, they look at risk and benefit. There, so there's a potential benefit of, of uh, there's a potential benefit of vaccinating a person who's previously been sick, um, and there's a potential risk of not uh, vaccinating that they could get sick again. So it's not clear how long natural immunity or uh, vaccine immunity is going to last. So far, we know for the vaccines, it looks like up to six months with Moderna and Pfizer that they've looked at so far, that we still see pretty good antibody expression. Um, and again, someone may have gotten sick a year ago, and instead of trying to parse out and say, well, you got sick two months ago and a year ago, um, I think their benefit, the potential benefit of, uh, of vaccinating that group, it outweighs the, the risk. Again, it's outside of my field. I can tell you about these proteins and things like that, but more questions. You're muted, Elise. All right. Yep. <laughs> um, let's see. Is there a difference in the ability of the vaccine versus an actual anti—excuse uh, me—actual viral infection to provide long-term protection? So um, I'll say historically, with other um, viruses and other diseases, there are differences. Um, in this case, we're sort of learning in real time, and we're watching this process in real time. Um, but the answer would be that. Um, so if you get sick with COVID um, and you get very, very sick and you get very sick and you're sick three, four or five weeks or in the hospital, your immune system, as well as the rest of your, your physiologic systems are repressed and they're damaged. So there's a very good chance that yes, while you may have recovered, um, you very likely did not elicit a really robust immune response that is gonna be there for you to use later. So there's that possibility. Whereas when you get a perfectly healthy person gets vaccinated and they have a full complement, their B cell, their B cell complement and their bone marrow is all in, in place. Um, they will elicit a very robust response that should lead to, again, storage of these memory cells and very strong antibody production. All right, this one is kind of a two-parter. Um, you talk about a virus invading a cell. So the first part, how many viruses are typically entering, I went away, are typically entering a cell and which cells get invaded? All types or only certain types? Great question. Um, so the first question is, is difficult to answer, but I've been looking at a lot of numbers and it's, it's probably as few uh, as one to three viruses that in get into a cell can cause that cell to then replicate many viruses. So I think on average, we're probably looking at only three maybe two or three viral particles get into a cell and will produce several hundred viral particles. So that's the kind of propagation of individual cell. Now, um, if two or three viruses get in one cell, your immune system is gonna take care of that. So if you only have that, you've inhaled three virus particles, you're not gonna get sick. Again, um, generally speaking, it's probably in the 750 to 1000 is probably the threshold where you have to inhale that many. It means it's gonna hit a bunch of your cells and, and as the virus then has a chance to propagate and beat out your innate immune system. Two, which cells are susceptible? It's the cells that have high levels of expression of the ACE2. And so there are cells that line our respiratory tract, cells that line our vasculature, and cells that line our digestive tract that have very high levels of ACE2 receptor. And 
there are distinctions. Some individuals appear to have higher ACE2 receptor expression than others. And there is some evidence that very young children have low levels of ACE2 expression. And that may explain some of the uh, resistance to very young. These are sort of like, I think seven and younger uh, have lower levels of ACE2. So those are the cells that are susceptible because they have the ACE2 and because the virus has access to them in particular year in the respiratory tract. And those are generally epithelial cells or something or endothelial. If people, if they really are asking that, I can, you know, you can send me an email. I can talk about that all day long. Um, all right, let's see. I, I heard the claim that receiving a COVID vaccine will then limit one's antibodies in responding to other threats, that all of the body's resources will be dedicated to fighting the COVID virus only. Is this true? Um, so again, I'm not an immunologist, but I'm going to say that's not true. So um, surprisingly, and this is a similar story when we talk about other people that get multiple vaccinations, um, we are being infected by all kinds of things all the time. I know, you know, we all, we wash our hands and we're careful. Um, we are eliciting um, our antibody responses to lots of things all the time. So no, um, I do not believe there's any evidence that soon after vaccination, you're more susceptible to other infections. Um, and it's not that your immune system can only do one thing at a time. In fact, you can, uh, those, again, all, every day you're making somewhere in the order of a billion naive B cells, and they're set to respond to all kinds of things. And so, uh, and you also have quite a capacity for storage of these memory cells. So it's not like if you stored up memory cells for COVID, you don't have any space for other things. Thank you, Matt. Um... Let's see, why do some people have such strong reactions to vaccines and others don't? <clears throat> that is a great question. Um, why do some people like me and others don't is probably the same response. The, the point being is that um, every person at any given moment is, uh, contains the entire history of the unique history of that person, all the various infections, all and the genetic makeup and the um, exposure to environmental toxins, the amount of exercise they've done or not done. So um, there are variations between individuals. It's why you can't do a clinical trial with two people. It's why you need to have a significant number of people and everyone is slightly different than everyone else um, as much as we would like to match. It's one of the actual problems in, in biomedicine when we work with something like a gen set of genetically identical rabbits or genetically identical mice at the exact same age and we learn something and then we try to translate that to humans, there are always confounding elements with humans because there, there is diversity among us. And again, with respect to immunity it's, uh, and allergy, there's lots of different um, factors that, that again, someone that knows way more about this than I could tell you some more details, but that's really the bottom line is that everyone has elements that make them different so that I get an injection in my arm and my arm hurt for three days. Um, my wife's arm didn't hurt much at all. And, and so that's just, I mean, my daughter's arm is still red and inflamed you know, a week later. And that's just the sort of, each person has slightly different components and it's a very complicated system. So I do my best. I'm sort of what's referred to as a reductionist, as a biochemist. So I try to reduce a problem to something I can understand, but then I have to recognize and all scientists have to recognize in biology, it is, the most sophisticated complex machine that you could ever imagine. And just imagine building a machine where instead of giving it straight gasoline, you could give it a banana, give it some popcorn, maybe don't give it anything for a day. And it goes through a whole different series of reactions. It can wake up, it can sleep, it can run, it can think about things. I mean, this is really a remarkable, really complex organism that we've really, you know, we are digging and digging to get knowledge about it. And we're able to get enough knowledge that we can use it in an effective way. But there's a lot of things we don't know. Right. This seems to be a popular one in the Q and A. Um, if we need to take another vaccine a year from now, can we take an mRNA vaccine, even though our first dose was a J and J vaccine? Yeah, I mean, so again, I'm not your doctor, I'm not a physician, I'm not able to tell you, but I, I from sitting here from what I know, I don't see why not. And I don't see why not um, that if there is a booster. So for instance, if a variant does pop up and that variant uh, 
is able to elude our antibody response to the previous version, this we'll call a wild type version of this protein, then um, again, the RNA vaccine mode could very rapidly create a RNA sequence that matches that variant. And you could then get a booster with that variant sequence. And I would envision, and but again, you know, so again, this outside of my practice, I would envision that you could then treat all kinds of people with that booster. Yeah. I don't think you're locked in. I think that's what the question is. Am I locked into whatever brand? And I don't think you are. Certainly the current guidelines are, if you have a Pfizer dose today, you should get Pfizer dose three weeks, not then Moderna. And, uh, and same and vice versa. All right. Um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are based on mRNA, while AstraZeneca and J&J &J are based on the adenovirus vector. Could this be the reason why the latter are causing abnormal blood clotting? The hot topic of today. Yeah, it's a hot topic. Um, so I'll start with um, first, you know, formally speaking, we don't know the latter are causing abnormal blood clotting. So we have six cases out of almost 7 million injections. But if they were, it certainly could be the reason they could be somehow associated. And this is what the FDA is going to do, is they're going to look at those six individuals and say, what characteristics did they have that might have made, made them susceptible to that response? But certainly, um, if you told me a year ago that we invented a vaccine and six, uh, one out of a, or slightly less, slightly fewer than one out of a million people are going to have a blood clotting response. I would have been dancing in the street saying we've just had a great success. So yes, um, anytime you uh, invade your system with any foreign agent, you're activating a whole series of, of uh, responses. So the innate immune system, the acquired immune system, as well as blood clotting and something called the complement system, which again, I don't have time to go through that, but those are, they're all integrated and related. The particular six cases, um, I, from again, very limited information that I learned earlier today, but there is some sort of intriguing uh, similarities between something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is a blood clotting disorder induced by this drug heparin, which is anticoagulant, but in a small number of people can induce coagulation through this process. And it is very similar in that there are the six uh, individuals that had this blood clotting disorder seem to have low levels of what are called platelets. These are cells that are involved. And when you get a cut, the initial sort of block plug is made by platelets. So they have low level of platelets, but they have higher clotting. And that's, a, again, an a unusual characteristic and something we see with a, a side effect of a co very common drug heparin. So did those six patients in the past year have surgery where they were given a heparin injection? I don't know, but those are the kinds of things the FDA wants to look at and see if there's some connection there. I just want to be mindful of, of time, and I wasn't sure how far over we wanted to go because it is 617. Do you, do you want to have time for just like one or two more questions, Matt? So I, I would say that anyone that's on this call is certainly welcome to drop out as soon or as, as whenever they want. I'm happy to stay, you know, I think another few minutes. If there's a lot of questions, I'd rather take the opportunity, the fact that people are here and I'm here to answer as best I can. Okay, um, let's see next. Oh, how is the virus able to suppress step one interferon? That's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer. And as far as I can tell, we don't know the answer. We just know that um, the field knows that um, the, and it's, they're not the only virus that has learned this. So I think there's a sort of a number of people, um, certainly a number of people very actively trying to research that. In one of the therapies, um, for that has been tested in, in a trial right now for um, COVID-19 is to replace interferon, is to inject uh, patients with interferon as a way to try to repress that. Um, I don't know, it's, it's actually quite fascinating to me and maybe somebody does know, but as far as my research, I, I'm not aware of how it is able to do that. It's probably one, so there are I think 27 proteins encoded on that viral RNA um, so maybe one of them is playing some role in, in suppressing that response or, or one or some combination of them, but I don't know. Um, let's see. Why does the Pfizer vaccine require super cold storage? Yeah, um, great question. So um, this is a case where nature is better than, uh, than science at some level. So um, the virus itself, like the J&J, &J, the adenovirus, these viruses have evolved and they're very able to withstand all kinds of things. So um, the virus itself doesn't need super cold storage. The, um, 
the Moderna and uh, Pfizer need cold storage because they're, um, those lipid nanoparticles are stable, but not stable for days and days and weeks. So at room temperature, they will break down. Why Pfizer needs more cold store, uh, colder temperature than Moderna, um, I don't know, aside from there are subtle differences in the ingredients. One of them has a different salt than the other. And all these things can, uh, can work together to make that particle. It's really all about that particle, not the RNA. The RNA is essentially the same. It's the, um, uh, what's called nanoliposome is slightly different, with slightly different components. Um, they have learned though, that uh, I'm pretty sure that is now the practice is the Pfizer no longer needs the, uh, the, the very deep freeze, the minus eight degrees Celsius. Instead, it needs uh, sort of common freeze. So, so it looks like that also could have been, and this is what happens in development of a process. You start by freezing it and it works fine. And when you store it that way, so you're gonna keep doing it that way again. And you're, you're, you know, you're not gonna test every possibility when there is an immediate urgent need to get a product out. And, and so that that may have been part of it as well. All right, um, how do multiple doses of the vaccine serve to improve the patient's ability to develop immunity? So that's a great question. So um, if you remember the RNA, while normally stable for minutes is now stable for hours. So you're gonna express some spike protein and um, you're gonna raise a immune response to it but it may not be so robust that you're storing a sufficient number of those memory cells. So the second blast comes in, it activates those memory cells. When those memory cells become active, they do two things. They either, they will start to divide and they'll generate plasma cells, which make antibodies. And they'll also generate more memory cells. So you're expanding your memory cells with that second challenge it's referred to. So when you get the second shot, it takes you from whatever number, you know, X number of memory cells to 10X memory cells. So now you're a little bit more protected going in the future. Um, how does the spike protein leave the cell? Um, so the spike protein doesn't leave the cell. Um, so the spike protein is expressed. Um, it is what's referred to as a transmembrane protein. So it'll be expressed. In, and incorporated into your member, into our cell's membrane. So it's sticking out of our cell's membrane, or it sometimes gets degraded and spit out as small fragments, but the majority of it is then gonna be basically presented on our membrane, sticking out. Um, the part is so hard to go through, but our, that um, acquired immune system is gonna make naive B cells to all kinds of things, except for at a certain stage in development, it kills off all the cells that make antibodies for our proteins. So it, it's going to recognize that there's a foreign protein sticking out of our cell. Right. We have three questions left, just to let you know. Um, is it possible that max, mass vaccination could apply evolutionary pressure towards immune escape? Uh, that's a great question. So um, again, I'm, it's not my expertise, but um, I would say it's, it's really quite the opposite. So the, yes, um, a mass, mass vaccination, so the mutation rate does not change. Um, if there are 100, 100 times when the virus is replicating, you have a certain number of possible mutations. If there's a million times the virus is replicating, you have, what is that? That's a uh, 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 10,000 times more mutations. So um, mass vaccination is not going to put pressure. It certainly is putting pressure because the only uh, virus that's gonna escape is gonna be one that can get around that, but, but you're preventing that random mutation rate. So it's quite, the benefit of mass vaccination is that you reduce the number of times that this virus has an opportunity to make a mistake. And a mistake, every mistake has a possibility to make a, uh, a, a immune escape variant, right? So, um, so that's, I would say that, that certainly, I mean, there is this sort of in the, kind of uh, ether there, people say, well, if we just vaccinate, then we're gonna, yeah. So um, if we don't vaccinate, we're gonna, if we didn't vaccinate in next year, we'd have to say, another, we might have another million people dead, right? So again, this is sort of outside of my field though. Um, what would it take to have our memory cells to store COVID information for the rest of our lives? 
Great question. This is another great mystery in biology. So some things we get once or we get vaccinated once and we seem to be resistant for the rest of our lives. Other things we get uh, once or we get vaccinated once and every three or four years we need to get a booster sort of induce that. So I, we don't know with COVID and we don't know with these particular um, antibodies and these particular uh, uh, this particular antigen. Um, my guess is, um, again, with what we know so far, I would say that it's probably very likely that the vaccine-induced immunity will last several years, maybe you know two, three, five years, maybe longer, but that wouldn't be un unlikely to have it last only two, three, five years. So there's very likely that we would need either a booster with the same vaccine, or by then maybe it'd be a more prominent variant that we'd be targeting. So what it would take is, um, uh, getting vaccinated many times, or maybe this is one of those cases where we'll be good for life, but I don't, it really comes down to just observing and look at empirical data and just determining, and I don't think there's a great way to predict it. Um, is there a risk of cancer development from introducing stable RNA molecules in the vaccine? Um, not to my knowledge, um, and I don't see any means by which there would be. So that's all I can tell you. And again, they're stable RNA molecules, but they're now stable for hours instead of minutes. So um, several days after, you, um, probably two or three days after you've been vaccinated, I don't think there's any more of the mRNA left in your cells. Um, uh, and if it were, it's not going to be in there for very long. And there's no way that that, and this is again, a nice and important thing to bring out. So the MR, there is no, at least understood, and I, there's no biological mechanism by which mRNA is going to integrate into DNA, right? So it doesn't do that um, unless the mRNA is converted into DNA. And certainly there are viruses that do that. And in fact, actually, I think something on the order of 8% of our genome is already contains viral DNA that used to be mRNA through these things called retroviruses. So, so number one, that's happening all the time in us. And number two, um, I think it's very unlikely that the 30 or 100 micrograms of RNA that are being injected with these uh, vaccinations uh, could, and I don't know of any feasible mechanism by which they could influence cancer. But of course, you know, there's a lot of things I don't know. We thought you knew everything, Matt. No. <laughs> All right, um, I have one last question. Um, can you use the CRISPR gene editing to destroy the coronavirus RNA? Um, interesting question. So the CRISPR gene editing can edit DNA. Um, it's not going to, so yeah, I, I, so I, I guess I'm a little confused by the question. So no, the CRISPR gene editing system is not going to be able to effectively edit the, it would not effectively edit um, the coronavirus RNA while it's actively replicating and infecting you. So, um, I mean, it's interesting. There are lots of different things, but it's, uh, I think that's not a likely approach. That's, unless anyone has any more questions to put into the q and I think we're finished with that portion. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone for attending this, but I know um, Dean Malikshi has joined us and he would also like to say a few words to close us out this evening. I, I just want to say thank you for all of you who came this evening and a great, great thank you to Matt for teaching us a lot today. I think it's a great lecture. I think it shows the power of science. It shows the power of investing in things that sometimes you don't really know where it will lead to. With all those developments as Matt showed us over many years in fundamental biology, in genome, in, in, in all of this uh, knowledge that we have acquired over many, many years, thanks to many, many generations of scientists, I think is what leading us to fight this terrible disease uh, globally. Uh, so again, I want to thank Matt for, uh, for really a great lecture. Uh, I want to thank Liz for organizing it. I want to thank Dimitra for being here. I want to thank all of you for being here. And uh, we hope to see you again um, in many other lectures that we will do in the college, uh, because we think, and I think, and I'm convinced that actually a, a public that knows more about science is uh, a much educated, a public, better educated public, but also we have a better society overall. So thank you again. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Demeter. Thank you, Matt. Greatly, great, great lecture. Thank you so much. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. If anyone has questions, they can always send me an email.
and I can try answering them. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was great, Matt. Thank you so much. That, that was wonderful.